I solve a lot of puzzles here on YouTube, but not every puzzle that I solve makes its way into one of my videos. Like many puzzle hunters, I like getting a team together and solving during the live event, but that means that there are some great puzzles during these live events that I never get to talk about here on the channel. So today, I wanted to pick a few great puzzles from some recently completed puzzle hunts and talk about what it is that made them all so much fun to solve. Hi, how are you? I'm Anthony from Cypher House Escape, and this is Awesome Puzzles. Before we get started, I want to mention that I'll be leaving some links in the description down below for all of the puzzle hunts that I'm going to be covering in today's video. They're all completely free and amazingly well crafted, so I highly recommend that you check them out if you're looking for something fun to do. Okay, now let's get on to the puzzles. The first puzzle that I want to talk about today comes from Edric's 2020 Puzzle Hunt. It's a puzzle hunt that I recently covered here on the channel. The puzzle that I want to talk about is called Just Read the Instructions number two. And this is an example of what I call a sequential information puzzle. This type of puzzle typically involves extracting some information from a large set of data. That information will then give us an instruction that tells us how to extract another piece of information from the puzzle. We repeat this process going through all of the information in the puzzle until we finally arrive at the final answer. So this kind of puzzle is a little bit like an escape room where each sub-puzzle unlocks the next puzzle in a way, however it's all crammed down to one page of paper. So the first step with this kind of puzzle is to find that starting instruction, find the first thing that the puzzle wants us to start building off of. And uh, all that we're presented in this particular puzzle is this grid of seemingly random words. I've brought the puzzle over to an Excel spreadsheet so that we can keep track of the information as we move through the puzzle. Now just to be completely clear, I have solved all of the puzzles that I'm presenting in today's video before. This is more of a highlight reel of some of my favorite puzzles from recent events, and this is not a cold solve video like some of the videos I've done in the past. Now, we need to keep in mind that the first piece of information, the first detail that we're supposed to extract, is usually intended to be pretty easy to find. So when we look at this grid, the first thing that should stand out to us is this darkly colored row. It's darker in the original puzzle than these other cells that are also highlighted below it. So a lot of people would focus their attention here first. And that's a good instinct because this is where we get our first piece of information. Feel free to pause the video if you want and try to get that first piece of information from this row of words. What we do is we take the first letter of each of these words. It's one of the easiest and most simple extractions that uh, puzzle hunts tend to use. When we do that, we get the phrase random rot. This may sound a little weird, but it is actually our first instruction on what we want to do in this puzzle. So what does random rot mean? Well, when I think of random, the first thing that usually comes to mind for me is generating random numbers. And ROT is another kind of very commonly used form of encryption in puzzle hunts. It stands for rotation, and it's essentially a Caesar shift cipher um, that just moves all of the letters forwards or backwards in the alphabet by a specific amount. So what this instruction is telling us is that we need to apply random rotations to something. But what is that something? Well, now's when it's important to remember that we also have these other highlighted words within the grid. If you're looking for a useful tool to help you with rotating these letters, I recommend the website rot13.com. It's a very simple website where you enter in your text in the first box and then you choose how much you want to rotate that text in the second box. So the first word in our uh, set of words that we're interested in here is the word shads. And we see that when we rotate by 13, we don't get anything of particular interest. However, I can cycle through the rotation amounts here, essentially randomly picking rotations. And eventually I'll notice that at a rotation of one, so shifting all of the letters forwards in the alphabet one space, we actually get another common word. In this case, it's Tibet. So that's a pretty interesting feature. What happens if we try shifting a different word from one of those pink sets of words? In this case, I'm going to pick the word pecan. 
And we see that by shifting the word pecan one letter in the alphabet, we don't get anything of particular interest, it's just gibberish. But what if we start randomly picking other rotations for this word? Well, if we shift all the letters by four spaces, we actually get the word tiger, another fairly common English word. We can keep track in our Excel sheet of all of these shifted words, the new words that they shift into, and how far we had to shift them. I'll take that next step with the power of editing magic right now. Wah! Take a look at that, isn't that cool? So now we have the original words, we have the words that they shifted to, and we have this number that indicates how far we had to shift the original word to get the new word. Now, one thing that we might notice right away is that we didn't have to shift any of these words particularly far in the alphabet. Anytime that we see numbers that are smaller than the length of our words, it's usually a pretty good idea to try using those numbers to index into the words. So if we use these numbers to index into the new words that we just obtained, we see something interesting happens. We take the first letter of Tibet and we get a T. We take the third letter of Hirad and we get an R. The sixth letter of Grungy is a Y. That spells the word try. If we continue going along, and this spells the phrase, try ends up top. And that's our next instruction. I've copied the original grid down a little bit further into our Excel spreadsheet, and I've removed the coloration because we've already used that clue. So now let's see if we can interpret our next instruction. Try ends up top. Since we no longer have coloration in the grid to tell us where to go, we should expect that our new instruction is telling us not only what to do, but also where to look in the grid to do that. In this case, up top is telling us to look at the top row of the grid. And we're told to try the ends. So what happens if we try the final letter of each of these words in the top row? We get E-D-G-E-S, that spells edges, three, the number, R-D-S. That spells our next instruction, edges, thirds. Edges, in this case, could mean the edges of the grid, the left and right sides. So I'm going to highlight those pieces. And then thirds is telling us to take the third letter. On the left-hand side, we have M-I-D-D-L-E, middle. And on the right-hand side, we have O-F-O-D-D-S. And that spells our next instruction, middle of odds. I've highlighted the words with an odd number of letters in the grid now. Let's go through and take the middle letter of each of these words and see if that spells something for us. The middle letter of Mustang is a T. Then we have the an R in ostrich and a Y in rhyme. If we keep going, we get an A from Shad's, the S from Irksome, um, a C from Pecan, I from Believe, and another I from Violinist. And that spells ASCII. If we keep going, we get O-N for ON. The number 8 is in Magic 8 Balls there. And then we get an L, E, T, T, E, R, W, O, R, D, S. This spells our new clue phrase, Try ASCII on eight letter words. So this time I'm going to go through and highlight all of the words in our chart that have eight letters. When I do this, we see that there's exactly one eight letter word in every column of the grid. Now we have to find a way to read these words as if they were ASCII. However, this chart shows us the specific ranges for both capital and lowercase letters. If we're using capital letters, we notice that the ASCII code is always between 65 and 90. It's important to note that this range of binary numbers always starts with the string 010. So if we're trying to look at our eight letter words in the grid and figure out 
how these encode ASCII, we can ask ourselves if we see any patterns in those first three letters of every word. We have G-A-D, H-A-N, K-I-L, D-I-L. The pattern is that these words always start with a consonant, and then a vowel, and then another consonant. So from this, we can determine that we might want to change our eight-letter words into eight bits of binary, with a one anywhere that we see a vowel, and an O anywhere that we see a consonant. I've translated the words into binary strings below their respective columns here. My Excel sheet got rid of the leading zeros, so just keep in mind that there's a leading zero in front of all of these. Now, if we look in our ASCII table for this string, 1001100, we see that that corresponds to the letter L, 1001100. We can go through and do this for all of these ASCII numbers. When we do this, we get the word letterbox, just keeping the order of the columns that the words are in. Now, you might think that this is another instruction, maybe referencing the letters within the boxes of this puzzle, but in actuality, letterbox is the final answer to this puzzle. So what is it that makes this puzzle so good? Well, one feature that I look for in puzzles is somewhere to start. I believe that it's important for puzzles to give solvers an on-ramp, something to kind of sink their teeth into before sticking them with that tricky aha moment. And this puzzle, in my opinion, does a great way of focusing our attention directly onto that second row and giving us a really easy extraction to start out with before hitting us with the trickier step of rotating the words in these other shaded cells. Another feature that I like about this puzzle in particular is that the various instructions that were given are kind of mixed in terms of difficulty. There's some harder steps, like the rotation of these words or converting the eight letter words into ASCII code. However, they're separated by a few easier steps in between, like things that tell us to just read the last letter of the first row. Putting these easier steps in between the tough aha moments means that the solver can feel like they're making more progress through a puzzle, and therefore they don't feel like they're just solving one tricky aha moment just to immediately get stuck again on something else. Finally, the third thing that I really like about this puzzle is that we've actually used every piece of information that we were initially given. It might not look like it just by going through the process and looking at this grid with so many words in it, but every single one of these words was useful in at least one step, and several of them were actually useful in more than one step. It would have been fairly easy to make a puzzle with a much larger grid, just propagated with a bunch of nonsense words that didn't contribute to any of the steps. But to me, this is just so much cleaner, so much nicer, that we've actually used every single word in the grid at least once to help us towards our final answer. To try out more of Edric's awesome puzzles, check out the link down in the description below. The second puzzle that I want to talk about today is from Puzzle Potluck 3, which is an event that ran back in June. This puzzle is called Iron Man, and it's an example of what's called a cryptic crossword puzzle. I haven't covered cryptic crossword puzzles yet on my channel, and they're pretty diverse, so much so that I could easily fill at least one more video just with details of cryptic crossword puzzles. So today I'm going to go over just a very brief description of what a cryptic crossword puzzle is, and I'm going to focus more heavily on the final extraction for this crossword puzzle. A cryptic crossword puzzle is kind of similar to a standard crossword puzzle where the ultimate goal is to fill in a grid with words running across and down, and these words are going to overlap in several places. However, the main difference between a standard crossword puzzle and a cryptic crossword puzzle is in how the clues are written. In a cryptic crossword puzzle, the clues aren't as straightforward as they are in a normal crossword puzzle. Most usually, Clues in cryptic crossword puzzles contain two pieces. There's a straightforward definition, kind of like what you might see in a normal crossword puzzle, but there's also a cryptic wordplay portion of the clue, and that provides an alternate way of finding the answer. 
The best way to understand how this works is to just start digging into some examples. So let's take a look at clue two down for the Iron Man puzzle. The clue is Sweetheart Oddly Brazen. Now, the three in parentheses means the same thing that it would for any other crossword puzzle. That's just telling us that our final answer is going to be a three letter long single word. The trickiest part about cryptic clues can sometimes be determining which part of the clue is the standard definition and which part of the clue is the cryptic wordplay. Most usually we could draw a straight line down the middle of a clue and say everything on one side of the line is the definition and everything on the other side of the line is the cryptic wordplay. In this case we can draw the line between the word sweetheart and the word oddly. The left hand side of the clue in this case is the definition and the right hand side is the cryptic wordplay. The cryptic wordplay in this case is the phrase oddly brazen. There are multiple different forms that the wordplay of cryptic clues can take, but in this case we can read it very literally as taking the odd letters of the word brazen. When we take those odd letters we get a B, A, and an E. And by consulting a dictionary we can see that bay is a word that means a person's boyfriend or girlfriend or sweetheart in this case. So bay is the answer to clue two down. So we found an answer that is satisfied by both the definition portion of the clue and also the cryptic wordplay portion of the clue. And once we have that definition just like a normal crossword puzzle we can fill bay into our grid. Now, like I said, this is just going to be a brief overview of cryptic crossword puzzles, but I do want to do one more example before moving on to the final extraction of this puzzle. Let's take a look at clue five down. The clue reads, kids corrupted hard drive, and we're looking for a four letter long word. In this case, the line that separates the cryptic wordplay portion of the clue and the definition falls between the words corrupted and the word hard. Knowing where to draw that line is something that comes with experience and just solving a lot of cryptic clues. So this probably isn't something that you would know just by looking at your first cryptic clue. Now, as I said before, the definition portion of the clue could be at the beginning or at the end. So for clue two down, sweetheart was at the beginning of the clue and that was the definition. However, for clue five, the definition is actually hard drive. So we're looking for a four letter word with the definition of hard drive. And the cryptic word play is the phrase kids corrupted. Now probably one of the most common forms of a cryptic crossword clue are clues that are telling you to anagram something. There are a lot of indicator words that can mean anagram. In this case, the word corrupted is what's telling us to anagram something within the cryptic word play. That word that it wants us to anagram is the word kids. So we need an anagram of kids that means hard drive. And after swapping the letters around a little bit, we can eventually figure out that that answer is disc. So once again, we found an answer that satisfies both the definition portion and the cryptic wordplay portion of our cryptic crossword clue. And as before, once we have an answer, we can fill it into the grid. If you want a chance at filling in the grid yourself, these cryptic crossword clues are actually on the easier end of the spectrum, so this is a pretty good puzzle to try out, even if you're fairly new to cryptic crosswords. So if you do want to try this puzzle yourself, you should probably pause the video now, because I'm about to go to the answer grid. Here's what the final answer grid looks like for this cryptic crossword puzzle, and now we need to figure out how to extract a final answer from the puzzle. As usual, the title and the flavor text can contain hints on what we need to do to get that final aha moment. Again, the puzzle's called Iron Man, and it's based off of the Marvel superhero. The flavor text reads, Tony Stark was playing with his favorite set of clubs. The ball just sailed right over the hole, Friday. You saw that, right? Well, boss, from my number crunching, it looks like the longer your club, the farther the ball goes. If you want, boss, I can grab a couple of physics textbooks. No, Friday. I think I'm all good here. So the flavor text takes the form of a conversation between Tony Stark and Friday. 
and Tony Stark is playing a game of golf. Now, we might also notice that the grid in this cryptic crossword puzzle is colored green, just like a golf course. The original grid even has this dark open hole in one of the spaces, which corresponds to this letter Y in the finished grid. So from this we might guess that in some way we're trying to play a game of golf on this course that is the cryptic crossword puzzle, but how do we do that? Well there is one clue in the cryptic crossword that maybe stood out to us while we were going through and filling out the grid. This is clue 35 down, and it reads, Adolescent lost tail where Tony takes his first swing. This clue might stand out because it talks about Tony Stark and his golf game, just like the flavor text does. The answer to this clue is the word T, T-E-E, -E, and we can see it's right here in the final grid. The way that this clue works is an adolescent is a teen, and the cryptic portion of the clue is telling us to lose the tail or the last letter of the word teen, and that leaves us with T. The definition is where Tony takes his first swing. So what do we need in order to start our golf game? Well, Tony needs to put the ball on top of the T in order to take his first swing. And if we look at where the T is in the grid, we see that there's actually an O directly on top of the T. As a matter of fact, that turns out to be the only O in the entire grid. So maybe this O is supposed to represent the golf ball, and we need to some way figure out how to hit that ball into the hole down here at the letter Y. Well, the flavor text hints that we need some clubs, and the title of the puzzle is Iron Man, iron being another name for a certain type of club. But we know the word iron isn't going to appear anywhere within the grid because we just found out that we only have one O. However, iron is a chemical element which has a symbol Fe. And we might notice that in the grid there are several places where the letters Fe are found together. Here I've highlighted each of the words in the grid that have the letters Fe in that order. What's interesting is that the Fe always appears at the end of these words which is also where the iron portion of the golf club would be. And perhaps most importantly, one of these instances of Fe for iron appears directly next to the ball sitting on top of the T. There's one more clue in the flavor text that tells us the longer the club, the further the ball goes. So this tells us that the longer each of these words is, the further that that club is going to hit the ball along the course. So if we don't count the letters F-E for the iron and just look at the length of the handle of the club, we have four letters in carafe, C-A-R-A. -A. So maybe that hits the ball four spaces away from the club. Doing that takes the ball over to this letter F over here. And again, it's very interesting to note that this puts us directly next to another instance of F-E for iron. So now let's hit the ball with this club, the Tartuffe. That takes us down to the letter L, and again, right next to one of our golf clubs. Hitting the ball a couple more times, we end up on this letter R, right next to the word Rife. And we can hit the ball with that club two spaces downwards and into the hole. So we've completed our game of golf, we're a couple over par most likely, but we've made it successfully into the hole. So how do we extract our final answer? The answer is to look at the spaces that the ball landed on on its way to the hole. We have F-L-A-T-T-E-R-Y, and that spells the final answer to this puzzle, flattery. So what is it about this puzzle that makes it an awesome puzzle? Well, the first thing for me is that I really enjoy it when a puzzle hunt puzzle has its roots in a standard puzzle type. For me, like several other puzzle hunters I would imagine, I got my start by working through books of sudokus, crossword puzzles, as well as playing puzzle games online. So I really like it when a puzzle hunt puzzle draws from one of these fundamental sources and adds a really fun aha moment on top of it to come up with something a little bit new and unique. 
Which leads me to my second point about what makes this puzzle awesome. The extraction is very unique. This is the first time that I've played a round of golf on top of a crossword puzzle. I think that's a really unique and interesting idea, and it made this puzzle a delight to solve. And in case it's not immediately obvious, it is not easy to construct a puzzle grid like the one that we have here. The designers of this puzzle needed to have several words that all ended in F-E. They needed to space them out and fit them both horizontally and vertically into this puzzle. They needed to position these words next to the letters for the word flattery. All the clubs needed to be the perfect length and spaced the correct distance apart. And they needed to fit all of that into a grid without using the letter O more than once. Whenever you add a lot of constraints into a crossword puzzle like this, it gets much easier to satisfy those constraints by making a huge puzzle, but these puzzle designers managed to do it in a 15x15 15 15 grid, which is kind of the standard shape for crossword puzzles. So for me, as someone who's tried to construct crossword puzzle grids in the past, it's very impressive that they were able to fit all of this into this puzzle. Finally, for my third note about what makes this puzzle awesome, I want to talk a little bit about the hints that were used during this puzzle. There's a lot of different preferences in the puzzle hunting world about how to use flavor text and how many hints are needed in a puzzle versus what you should expect a solver to be able to figure out themselves. In this case, the creators of the puzzle erred on the side of caution and included a lot of hints throughout the flavor text, as well as this explicit reference in the clue for T. I think especially for an extraction as uh, unique as this one, it's very important to include adequate hinting at how that extraction is going to work. So I'm very happy that the puzzle creators in this case included plenty of hints in order to get us to the final answer. So there it is, you have two awesome puzzles that highlight some of the things that I personally look for in Puzzle Hunt puzzles. So be sure to check out Edric's Puzzle Hunt 2020 and Puzzle Potluck 3. Again, both of those are linked down in the description below, and they were both a lot of fun, so I recommend checking them out. I hope that you liked this video. If there are other awesome puzzles or puzzle hunts that you want me to check out, leave a comment about it down in the comment section below, and I'll see if I can get around to taking a look at it. Expect to see some more one-off videos like this one here because I'm currently working on my next puzzle hunt solving series and it's going to take me a little bit of time to start getting those videos out. But anyways, that's it for today's video. Have a happy day, a happy life, and as always, happy escaping. Be good. No, I'm, I'm filming. Are you, are you serious?